Wargate Books presents an Op Center chat with Peter Nealon, author of The Lost, Book One, Ice and Monsters. Hey folks, my name is Walt, and today we are talking up Ice and Monsters from Peter Nealon. We have Peter here to uh, give us this awesome debut, uh, and joining us also is Wargate uh and and, and imperator wargate aficionado we have chaos actual it's good to be here right on uh helping us uh dose peter with some uh helpful marine questions we have baird from the discord is he here he's here i'm here i'm here just forgot to hit the unmute button it happens to the best of us we will try to keep the joke we'll try to keep the jokes to a minimum uh we got helix riding shotgun as well What's up, everybody? Hey, welcome aboard. Uh, so, uh, Nick, can you give us uh, the consigliere uh, kind of uh, elevator pitch that goes with Wargate Books? You know, Wargate Books is a new imprint by Jason Ansbach and I. Do you read me five by five? Am I good? Nope. You are Anybody good to go, me? sir. Yep, you're okay, good. Cool. You're good. Cool. Then Lima Charlie, let's go. Um, and, and basically, it's it's a new imprint that Jason Ansbach and I of Galaxy's Edge are doing. And we're really excited today because today is the first day that we are going to debut the first Wargate author uh, in, the, in the sort of Wargate fiction world. Wargate fiction ultimately, as an imprint, will have a lot of science fiction. Wargate as a genre starts off with a very... Um, clear mission of what kind of fiction it's going to deliver. Um, it's a three line mission statement. And basically in any Wargate novel, you have three elements and that is a fantastic or fictional universe, like everything from J.R. Tolkien style, something John Carter style, something Norse Valhalla, something. Then the second element that you incorporate are some hardened killers, a modern military uh, unit that can range any, anywhere from, line guys to striker guys to special operators to recon and then the third element is what uh, we like to call the perpetual taco machine which was a term uh propounded by walt robiard and basically it's a machine that can keep our killers supplied stacking skulls and that is basically wargate we're pretty excited about it people seem to like the genre uh in the forgotten ruin series which we're up to book six now and uh and and we're proud, I mean, extremely proud and honored, really, to have Peter partner with us and go with the first debut series. And honestly, the feedback that we're getting, what we've read, um, this is something that people are going to want to stick around for. Hell yeah. So, uh, Peter, can you uh, give us uh, uh, kind of the, the intro on how you started getting uh, tangled up in this universe? Uh, well, about a year ago. Uh, Chaos Actual over here hit me up and said, I have a project in mind for you. Uh, I'm interested. And uh, that got a copy of Forgotten Ruin into my hands, and I got the wheels started turning. At the time, I kind of thought that Nick wanted me to write a Forgotten Ruin spinoff, but then he said, no, we want your series. Okay, then. Safety's off. Uh, no breaks. Let's go. Since it's me, and I think I have one set of main characters who are not Marines, I had to go with uh, recon Marines for our modern military unit. And, uh, well, the world's a little different from Forgotten Ruin in that uh, I drew mostly from, so far, from Irish and Finnish mythology and put a little bit of my own spook story spin on some of it. So our boys uh, go through a fog bank in what's supposed to be an ordinary training op that's going to fortunately going to end in a live fire uh, range, which means they actually have ammo when they find themselves in the land of ice and monsters. Right on. Uh, the, uh, the initial uh, kind of setup of this, uh, we have a group of uh, we have a group of recon marines uh, that are supposed to be working with the Finnish. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, they were actually working with the Norwegians. Norwegians, uh, there we go. Off the uh, coast of Norway. Um, I've actually uh, 
one of the other platoons when I was in force did uh, some joint training exercises with the Norwegians. And I knew I wanted the the setting to be more uh, northern, so it was kind of an easy, hey, let's just slide this in here. Um, so th there is a, a precedent of some some training ops with Norwegians in Norway. Of course, when our guys are inserting, it's supposed to be July. When they come out of the fog bank, it's not anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those those opening scenes, uh, they they were a little uh, uncomfortable in just uh, just their skins. Yeah, I, th I think in that one brutal moment right there, which is like. like you perfectly executed what everybody in the military has experienced and you did it in a fantastical way that will now make it be fun. But uh, I don't know how everybody else's experience was, but whenever did the plan or the operation order match what you actually ended up doing? And so you've, absol you've absolutely captured that in a fun way now, as opposed to the sit around and wait way, which is reality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was there, there's that old saying that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. I discovered on my first deployment that no ops plan survives the first step outside the wire. <laughs> what about uh, when the officers get their hands on the paper? Let's not even talk about that. <laughs> So uh, real quick, let's uh, let's go to some of the guys who have uh, been really gracious with their time and jump in to, uh, to ask some questions. Um, uh, let's start with Helix. Uh, so uh, you're an insider. You got a hold of the book. Uh, uh, have you been able to read it all yet? No, I haven't. Um, I'm, I'm super interested in the mix between fantasy and military action stories, though. It's definitely the – I think it's my go-to genre now. Like that's all I'm going to stick with probably – until the perpetual taco machine stops like that's that's kind of it um but seeing as how like it's a it's a genre that's not really explored all that much my question to you pete was um so, seeing as how you're kind of going to be one of these founding people i mean i know there was the whole hp lovecraft that you know had all these eldritch horrors and still had guns in it and stuff but you have a big say in kind of where this this genre goes like where do you want to take it what do you see as like the long-term I don't know. What do you see as like the long-term universe for, for this genre that you're kind of help invent? That's an interesting question. I mean, most of my focus has not been on the, the necessarily the genre as a whole, more on this series in particular. And some of that's coming together as I continue to work on it. Now that uh, I was just talking to Walt the other day about how some of the, the cosmology has been solidifying as I go. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think there, I think there's going to be a uh, whoever has this kind of different sort of style of warfare is going to affect the world around them uh, over the long term. Now, is it going? What we're going to have to see is how much and in what direction. And that's going to depend on each author and the, the universe they create, too. And I don't, I don't know if I could sneak one more in, but yeah, um, when, you're, when you're doing your mythology research, I know there's, there's all sorts of goofy creatures and some that are like, all right, this needs to be more mainstream. Is there, like, is there one highlight and one really low light in terms of like things that you found that are like, this is not terrifying at all, or all right, that one's badass? Hmm. Well, a lot of the uh, a lot of the monsters that I kind of used in this one, in many ways, I just kind of drew the names because in a lot of the old stories, they're just described as being having these weird deformities without a whole lot of detail. So, a lot of what I did was I just had a detail. Um, Sometimes I'll look at something, some mythological figure, figure, and it's like, that's pretty cool, but it could be freakier. <laughs> and uh, I, I got my start as a storyteller, actually telling stories to other people around, a camp, around the campfire up at scout camp. So my start as a t storyteller was terrifying Boy Scouts into hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. 
So I, I draw on that sometimes. Yeah, there's a couple of instances, there's a couple of instances in the first book where um, you know you, you're you're hinting at a lot of the horror to come, and then by the second book, I mean, there was straight out nightmare fuel in that second and third book. But like this one, you you really get the creepiness that that not everything is right in Norway. No, or a lot of other places in this world. <laughs> uh, Baird or Beard. Hello, hit hello. Some, hit me with some questions, sir. So, what? Like you mentioned that you you had been in the region of Norway before, correct? No, I was not. Okay. Um, a, a, another platoon in uh, the Force Company was. Okay. All of my stuff was sandbox land. Uh, what What made you want to put the setting in Norway then? I've got a certain affinity for uh, the high alpine sort of environment. I live in Montana now, so if it's if it's steep and rocky and covered in dark trees, it just it speaks to me. No, I hear that. No, I actually grew up in a, a northwest Pennsylvania area, so I'm used to mountains and cold and that's why i moved to texas i was sick of it <laughs> so as as like as not to get to spoil it, but like reading some of the details of this frozen wasteland of the sorts like i can actually feel that cold in my bones as i'm reading it so th that which leads me to the next question is do you have a specific voice in mind when you're writing this or are you just writing how you think this kind of writing, how I think. Okay. So, what uh, what kind of drove you toward um, Gaelic slash Irish and Finnish myth? I mean, was there a certain kind of a uh, um, uh, like a pull from that? Like you had some experience with it, or was it something where you just said, "Yeah, this is the uh, you know this is what everybody else is doing. I want I want the creepy that's over here." Well, in some ways, some of it is my heritage. I'm ethnically Irish predominantly with some Scottish and German mixed in. So in some ways, this is this is my cultural heritage and I get to play with it. <clears throat> uh, and again, it's not something that has been all that mainstream either. Uh, Particularly, I mean, Tolkien drew a lot from the Norse Eddas and uh, and Finnish mythology as well. Uh, in fact, one of the Elven languages is largely sort of based uh, a, a branch off of Welsh, and the other is partly Finnish in root. Um, but that 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 Irish wildness hasn't been tapped that much so hey, let's so, go for it right on so as somebody who's who's read the books uh so far and and because i'm kind of cheating uh any chance that we're going to see the wild hunt in here Ooh, there's always a chance <laughs> Uh, anybody, anybody who, who came through uh, Irish and Gaelic myth through Dungeons and Dragons back in the 80s and 90s, that was always their go-to because that was just the, some of the coolest artwork back then. It just blew your mind. Uh, but you, you weren't actually coming at this from the D and D side. You were coming more of the uh, the myth side of this. So what was what were some of the things that you could do to prepare to write something like this? Uh, that kind of like put you in that headspace because I mean we have a lot of stuff in here, especially like when, when you know the sea trolls were were very very interesting in the beginning, but then we see um, you know uh, and I don't want to spoil anything, but we see some creatures that are traditionally from that mythology, and you're like, oh oh no, this is where this is going, and it kind of like midway through the book, it kind of like throws you for a loop. You're like, you know, if you know about it, you you know about it. Can you talk about that? Some of it was kind of uh, just, I, I was, some of it I was feeling out as I went. 
it's like okay i want to have i want to draw on this corpus of myth for the to, to create this this sort of world um and there's there's some other sort of cosmological stuff going on in the background that i don't want to get into too much detail on because well spoilers um but uh yeah, sometimes it was just like, what would fit right about here? Let me go dig. It's like, okay, so we had that. And what if I added this? Made it scarier. And uh, then made it really hard to kill. Let's go. Yeah, it's going to be guns or nothing. <laughs> Nick, the, uh, yeah, I was going to jump in real quick and say... You know, in the Forgotten Ruin thing where we, we write about rangers, one of the things that I enjoyed and the initial kind of obstacle to overcome this sort of fantasy modern military interaction writing is you're like, okay, well, my guys have airstrikes and Carl G's and M240 Bravos. I mean, like the average infantry platoon, even if they're not specialized, whether it's Marines or the Army, like they carry a significant amount of firepower. And so good luck with your orcs and your ogres and your sea trolls and all this kind of stuff. And it's like the fun thing is what I found that I enjoyed in the writing. And I think you did too, Peter, which is, you know, creating something magical and impossible and grounded in this sort of supernatural other. And then stepping back as a tactician playing chess and saying, okay, how do these guys overcome it? Not just with like, let's shoot stuff but let's let's actually apply real world tactics shoot move and communicate you know the things that you're taught in training let's let's apply that to this and see how they overcome it or don't and that's that's actually one of the thrills that i get out of writing forgotten ruin i just flipped through the, the monster manual and i'm like okay rangers are gonna fight slade today you know rangers are gonna fight this demon today this is all the stuff this demon can do uh because it tells you right there in the book and and now let's see what the rangers can come up with um to to counter that and unfortunately invariably with rangers it ultimately uh, involves excessive amount of high explosives is there really such a thing as an excessive amount of high explosives <laughs> no <laughs> what is it like a condom you'd better to have and not need yeah they would they would say no that explosives make me nervous but some people like to play with them, you know, like, yeah, there's, there really isn't. And, uh, and, and it's, it's fun sometimes just going back to that well again and again and again, but I do like, I do like, I do like my automatic weapons and, uh, I do like all the other, you know, just skills, which 90% of it is mental that the soldiers bring to it. And, you know, the, I think the, the problem with Hollywood is a lot of times is they assume you know, soldiers are kind of stupid and have this thing, but like they're huge problem solvers, Marines and, and soldiers. And so, so a lot of the times they'll work smarter, not harder. And I think that's that's always the challenge for us as military writers, which is to, to show how brilliant, brilliantly mischievous and just soldiers can actually be with sort of a less is more approach or it's just the whole kit. Right on. Uh, you know, like he was just saying, uh, it's, uh, you can never have uh, too many high explosives. You can never have too much mischief when you're on the battlefield. You know, what's that old saying? Uh, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Yeah. You know, uh, got a message coming in from Twitter. Uh, will the Marines get to have uh, real gear with a forge? Uh, raw Marines. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but <laughs> um, probably uh, uh, I know I served with a couple of guys who were combat camera. I served with some recon, uh, recon guys back in the day, uh, and they were always complaining about the gear. Um, we, well, that's we, because the, the Marine Corps always seems to get the Army's leavings. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I it's not my a few people that I, I did my first uh, workup using with like one pair of seven Bravo NVGs per team. And they look at me like, you, wait, what? You used what? Like, yeah, all the 14s were in Iraq. We didn't oh, even have any 14 side, state, stateside. That's I got to use my first pair of PBS 14s 
in the combat zone. Oh my God, that makes that's that's how poor we were. <laughs> so with the introdu- when with the introduction of the uh, the M twenty seven, was that an upgrade for you guys, or were you just like, oh come on? I'm not sure how they thought it was an upgrade to replace a light machine gun with an automatic rifle. That still doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. That kind of was happening just about the time I got out, but. Uh, yeah, it's okay. You've got a heavier M4 now. <laughs> and are they still rocking that right now? I believe so. Yeah. Oh. In fact, they've been talking about going to just that, replacing the M4 with the M27. Oh, that's weird. So a heavy M4 for the rifleman and a light machine gun. That's not a machine gun for the machine gunners. Yeah, so they don't have a machine gun. They just all have yeah HK 416s. Oof. Now what the what what uh, what about the uh, the special ops guys? Uh, so reconnaissance, Marsoc, um, you know all those guys. What are they rocking? I know Marsoc was using uh, scars, at least scar seventeens. I don't know what they're doing now. I think they're probably scrambling for a mission now. But uh, <clears throat> by the time I got out, we were still just rocking M fours. Now, we had M4A1s when I first deployed, and then they took those away. We just had the straight m 4 So we replaced our full auto with just burst, which is kind of sad. But Yeah. Nick, did you have something to drop in there? Uh, tunnel. I was um, – when, oh. uh, when someone said burst, uh, part of me died because I remembered my A3. <laughs> Oh God, I, I I didn't get the A threes. I, I get to skip those. Go right to M fours. It was a, it was the cursed weapon that had no actual function. Um, yeah, but you could make one of those little rifles. One. <laughs> what was that, Pete? I'm not sure I've ever actually seen an A three. We went yeah. straight from A twos to A fours. Yeah, yeah, the Picatinny rails with the hard stock, right? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people were not fans when I was over. Yes. Uh, Helix Beard, you got any more questions? Hit us up. Yeah, yeah, I've got I've got one. Oh, go ahead, Helix. Thanks, man. Um, I was gonna say, so you you did all this research going into like mythologies and stuff, but you're the author. You get to you get to basically pick whatever exists. Have you thought of like creating your own mythologies and like developing more original? really spooky shit i sorry if i can't swear but uh, if uh yeah like developing your own really scary stuff that might have its roots kind of in that nordic like really cold alpine kind of area or is it are you sticking mostly with like something that readers will find more familiar no i've already done some of that and some of it comes out nice and monsters and it gets a little more pronounced as the series goes on as walt can attest to uh particularly the, the mythology. Uh, like I said, the, the cosmology and what made this world the way it is starts to get a little clearer as time goes on. And especially as uh, the Marines start to be able to sort the truth from lies and legends. Because that's always a factor too. Yeah, fair enough. The, the old stories might have just been wrong for all we know (laughs) and uh will the marines get any will they get a chance to put some skill points into magic at all or is that am i am i reaching into territory that i shouldn't there reaching into uh into spoilerific territory there roger Uh, yeah there's some uh there's some weird stuff that goes on at one point well i mean first off here's the problem with marines and magic um it's probably going to involve necromancy, and it's going to be X-rated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Where are we? That's, uh, yeah, 26 minutes past the hour. That is now my new ringtone. Um, that is fantastic. Bear, did you, did you have a question? Yeah, I don't know if this will go into spoilery territory either, but um, uh, so obviously a, a part of the book – is the fact that they are no longer in uh, Kansas and all they have is what they have with them. 
So in Forgotten Ruins, they deal with the munitions issues with the forge. Is there a point in your series, because I haven't been a- managed to finish the book yet because technical issues, um, is there a point in your series where they their their uh, their thunder sticks are no longer useful to them? Sounds like a Viagra problem. <laughs> <laughs> There is a point where they may end up going black on ammo. The uh, the third the, the third leg of the Wargate tripod really doesn't come around until book two, but it does come around. Right on. But they do start to learn early on that even if you have resupply when you are way behind enemy lines with only your leather Cadillacs to carry you and all you can carry is what's on your back and in your chest rig every one of those bullets gets really precious and you kind of want to have a backup that doesn't require more bullets and that's where they start to find sharp pointy and hacky things really useful Oh, yeah, I'm excited for the Marines to go a little medieval on it. It'll be fun to read. So because because and the question I would have is, um, you know, obviously the Rangers uh, have a cult and it involves the Tomahawk, which is, you know, very much North American. And and I think you have a a sort of affinity for Northern Europe and, and the weapons and things like that. And just also, you know, I don't know Marine culture and, and I and I know that you do obviously um what kind of hand weapons are the marines going to gravitate towards or are they going to turn everything into a pugil stick they're pretty much going different guys are going to graduate uh going to be drawn towards different weapons some guys like axes better some guys like swords everybody has knives i mean every recon marine i've ever known wanted that knife kill I only know of one who ever did, and that was an accident. But uh, yeah, I think generally, generally speaking, Marines tend to go for blades versus like clubs and stuff like that. I mean, blades, clubs, rocks, whatever works. So we might we might not see a Marine Corps Legolas then. Would you really go for a bow if you've got a rifle? Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, the, the blades are for when, hey, there's a there's a swarm of things coming after me, and bolt just draw, locked back on an empty mag, and there's just no time for that speed reload. <laughs> so you're confirming the existence of an enchanted K bar, then, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> uh notice he uh he uh avoided that question the sip of I, coffee <laughs> i have one coming in from twitter what is more scary a marine all done with the monsters bs or some of the monsters coming after them that's a good question some of, the, some of these guys who are sending these Twitter messages have read your book, and they're former Marines. So they're they're saying they're, I'm trying to cherry pick the ones that um, are not going to get me thrown off of Twitter and uh, and 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 YouTube. Uh, so yeah, there's that. Uh, but yeah, which one's more scary, the Marine that's all done with like uh, no, nope, I am all done with you and everything you stand for, or the monster coming after them? That sometimes seems to depend on the situation. Because some of these monsters aren't quite ready for what they're running into. <laughs> but at the same time, none of the Marines were quite ready for the monsters they were going to run into either. Right I mean, at the very beginning, you've got that uh, you got that sea troll that comes up and tries to bite Connor's face off, and it doesn't go well for it, does it? A close call on that on that one, though. Definitely a close call. Uh, Nick, where did you uh, where did you envision when you first talked to Pete um, that this that this would kind of go? Would, did, did what we actually ended up with was that what you kind of perceived, or did it take a different shape than than when you start, when you guys started? 
Okay. Before I start talking, I just want to make sure you're reading me loud and clear, right? Because I don't want to like go off for 20 minutes and then they're like, oh, we haven't heard you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, we got you. Well, um, you know, like here, you know, here's an inside baseball thing. Um, Peter and I have been friends on, on Facebook for, for quite a while and just, you know, casual friends. And, and we, we seem to have the same affinity for storytelling and Tolkien and, and things like that. And, uh, we're both, uh, M1 enthusiasts and, uh, we love the SOCOM, you know, you know, so save your hate, don't add us over the SOCOM, but we love it. And, um, the thing that sometimes writers in Jason and I's position do is we try to, to take other writers and co op them to build our brand. So, hey, why don't you come over and write in my universe? And, you know, like, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get some of my fans. But the reality is, is you're just using that person. And I'm very interested in developing other writers. So you see that I talk about it on other channels and I even do classes and I give away free advice. And I don't know why all that I do that because I, I, that'll all eventually bite me in the ass. But I'm really, really big on helping veteran writers um uh you know get a shot because i know they're never going to get a shot with mainstream publishing because it's so woke and left wing and and things like that they're only going to cherry pick like guys who are in the coast guard who think guns are bad and then they can write science fiction novels so uh, i'm really big for for champ uh, championing championing i can't even say that word um veteran writers and so when i i came to peter i said hey i'm doing this new thing it's called wargate it's a genre modern military unit, perpetual taco machine, fantasy element. Um, I knew, I knew Peter was going to be strong as, as a recon Marine, but I also, where I was really confident in working with him is I knew that he had a really good sense of the fantastic and mythological world buildings because we talk about Tolkien a lot and interchange on that. And so I, I knew that he was really going to do well there. And I knew that the greatest thing that I could do to sort of help um, not, not that I needed to help his career because he has some, some really outstanding real world military th thriller series, but we were entering a new, new territory, which is fantasy and a whole new genre, which is Wargate. And, um, what I wanted to do was instead of just having him come into Forgotten Ruin and, and build that universe, I was confident that he could create his own IP which we intellectual property, which we have um, in in Ice and Monsters, and 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 begin to acquire a fan base that, as the the first first guy said, you know, like this is my jam now, you know, uh, modern military fantasy is my jam, and so I think you know we're the first in on this genre, and usually the first people in that really have a tendency to like scoop up all the readers. And then we'll know when sort of the locusts come along and start, you know, copying us and everything like that. But um, I knew Peter could do it. And I knew that the best thing that I could do for him was not have him build a forgot Forgotten Ruin novel, but have him build a Peter Nealon series, which I wanted him to do. And I think he's uh, he, he has exceeded any expectations that I had. And when he wanted to go all Valhalla, I was like, okay, I know that commercially that's going to that's gonna represent well. And, and the one thing that, you know, I, I think, I think Marines are ranger equivalent in many ways and it just in the ethos and the warrior culture. And I knew that that was going to resonate with the readers because at the end of the day, contrary to what the culture is trying to tell us, people dig studs whacking shit. And that's, and that's what this is. I hope all of that was recorded absolutely <laughs> okay. we can we can use that for some b-roll later i think it'll be used in my war crimes trial but i'm cool with that <laughs> <laughs> they're just going to play over and over again because people yeah. dig people whack and shit. yeah um, yeah i'll have some senator mr call did you literally say <laughs> that people dig studs whacking shit i'm all yep I, that's me and they'll be like well the execution wall is right over there and i'm all great <laughs> Can I tap dance before you blow my brains out? And they're like, nope. And I'm all, well, this might as well happen. <laughs> uh, speaking of happening, uh, we have uh, the uh, coordinator of our Discord server, uh, Daniel, uh, who's uh, dropping in to say hi and uh, uh, hopefully ask some questions. Uh, what's been the reception on Discord for the book, uh, Daniel? Can you talk about that? Uh, a lot of people seem to be pretty hyped about it. Um, the only one thing that i saw was somebody said 
Uh, it's not not enough infinite taco machine, but uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of people seem second to be book. Liking... <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like give give it a chance. You know, uh, I, I was actually talking to another person, and they're like, oh, "Forgotten Rune didn't really tickle my fancy quite quite right." You know, came off a little too too serious. I'm like, well. Uh, let's give uh, let's give ice and monsters a shot because uh, who knows maybe that'll that'll be what you need and so uh, you know as soon as uh, as soon as everybody starts catching up on that I think uh, I think Peter might have a uh, a bunch of uh, cool fans that are that are all hyped about it. I mean we've already got a uh, section under Discord um, for under the Wargate Publishing tab for the Lost and uh, I know uh, a lot of people are like. Uh, at least some people have already pre-ordered it, and you know they they they're probably getting ready to tear through the audio, you know, ASAP. Right on. Uh, and while we got a minute, uh, Helix Baird, did you guys have any more questions? I mean, I'll ask questions till the cows come home. Bring but, it. Uh, <laughs> sure. All right. So, so with regards to an operation, you said that you you did all of your deployment time over in the in the kitty litter right yeah so so in terms of like operational stuff that that you're able to bring into kind of a different environment how much of that is drawn from experience versus asking buddies that did it versus like you know just coming out of your own mind most of the basics are just it's I mean, I was a recon marine for eight years, so with the exception of free fall, I covered pretty much the entirety of the the kind of operations a recon does. Um, mostly in training, because in the environment that was particularly Iraq, a lot of the, the cool stuff we just couldn't do because of what it was. Uh, so the the movements, the tactics, all that sort of stuff. That's stuff that I pretty much drew from my own training and experience. And that's what I've been doing for combat novels for the last 10 years. Badass. So what about the, um, I think the something that's kind of unique about this is that they are, they're very much stranded. There's no, you know, there's no giant box of ammo that they can just go reload their, their weapons with. There's no, there's a lot of support that's just not there anymore. Um, and I really like the idea of not just military and fantasy finally getting a really cool blend, but now we're lumping in a little bit of like, we're sprinkling a little bit of survival on there too. Um, and those military stories, I think, are, are some of my favorite where it's like, all right, I know that there's... You know, I can eat X, Y, and Z, and it's going to be nasty, but it's better than eating nothing at all. Yeah, and uh, I knew with the way I wanted to tell this story, the way that uh, I, mean, I, I love Forgotten Ruin, but I knew that with mine, I wanted to take it a little bit farther away from the, the technological stuff. That there, There's weird, weird stuff going on in the background here, and that's how they got there in the first place. So that was going to nece necessarily cut off some of that uh, some of that resupply s solution and throw them into this situation where we got to learn to live off the land, or we're all going to die. Even if we manage to keep all the scary stuff with too many eyes and too many teeth in the dark off of us. And that's, think, that's, okay. that's just it's it's a feature that I think doesn't get dealt with enough in the the regular the real world military thriller stuff that I write the rest of the time as well as this kind of thing that when you're out there in the boondocks the weather has every bit as much to do with your survival as the enemy sometimes, particularly when it's cold. And we see that in the first book, too. Uh, you know, they're working for the first quarter of that book. They're working in all the wrong gear because of the situation. Oh, yeah. 
which I thought was was a really interesting take on that because you know a lot of times you see in military thrillers you see in some of the science fiction stuff you know it's like Hicks on the on the Sulaco strapping his shin guard on and you know his his buddy Hudson yelling let's get it on and the gunny going come on let's go let's get on the drop ship you know and everybody's all stacked and racked and ready to run you know in this um they're stacked for the mission they were out there for and then they land and they're like oh crap we gotta move <laughs> and how many military operations in the last 50 years has that been the case too? oh my god yeah ridiculous when the guys had chosen had nothing when the weather hit they were scrambling for any kind of cold weather gear yep uh some of the special forces guys in vietnam with uh, uh, the wrong kind of boots for the terrain. You had the guys in Mogadishu. Uh, I mean, you, you name it. There was just tons and tons of stuff. The supply system is always a generation behind where it needs to be when stuff clacks off. Yep, you ain't lying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for the perpetual taco machine. <laughs> taco. Uh, questions. Let's let's hit Pete with some questions as we got a few more minutes to uh, on our launch of Ice and Monsters, uh, on sale now uh, from Wargate Books. You can get it at all the fine uh, e-tailers, retailers. Uh, you can find it on the Zon if you should so need to. You can go to uh, wargatebooks.com, find it, uh, some links to get it there. Uh, yeah, go out there and get this. Uh, all five-star reviews so far, So from what I've seen, so that's fantastic. That's all the bots that we, we hire, right? Uh, don't get weird. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hit Pete with some more. You questions. know it'll be, you know it'll be a solid um, uh, Wargate novel when he gets a one star review from a guy who says that uh, the person who wrote this doesn't know anything about the military and never served, and he <laughs> knows because he's an Air Force Air Force reservist. And uh, and and he hates these phony military writers. That's when it's a solid Wargate novel. Yeah, I'm still shooting for the review from the Civil Air Patrol guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, somebody got that. Uh, go ahead, Swordfish. So, um, Peter, uh, have you got an idea for any kind of uh, good old merch for for those people that that do like merch and things like maps and stuff? There is, there is a map. In fact, the there's also a map for book two that's uh, almost finished now. So maps, maps definitely we could do. Um, We're gonna be doing uh, hardcover books as well, um, and then get those signed too, because uh, that's another thing that a lot of people do is they'll they'll get the uh, audio book or Kindle and they'll read it there and they'll they'll be like, yeah, I want I want I want a signed copy of that just for yeah, the sake I of want, having I it. I want that physical copy before Audible's comes sweeping in and erases the book again. <laughs> I, I believe... Hey, that only happened once so far. <laughs> once is happenstance, twice is coincidence. Three times we well, you know what three times is. It's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry, Nick. I'll you, you'll come up to the gulag up here with Jason, and, and I'll slip. <laughs> I'll slip in donuts in between the bars for you. It'll be fine. As long as there's a file in the middle. Um, Baird, you've been a little quiet. Why don't you go ahead and uh, throw throw a man here a question? Well, I, I, so I was sitting here thinking, and I've noticed a trend between um, Nick and Jason's books, both the with the first Legionnaire book and then the first Forgotten Ruins book, and with your book now, there's this really small, small and subtle detail that I'm sure a lot of people missed, but it's this um, the uh, how do I say this the 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 officer who's really not all that great. <laughs> Captain America. Is is that is that drawn from personal experience or is it just you know for book? Do you have someone in mind or is it just a conglomerate of stupidity and one person that just works for the story that you're drawn from? Well, now, or is that too much? <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever actually quite had a platoon commander as bad as Captain Sorensen. Quite. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> You head over retail and you'll run to managers like that all the time. It's great. Came awfully, awfully close though. It's 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 
I can't guarantee that a couple that I've had would not have reacted exactly the same way in the same situation. Let's put it that way. Yeah. The number of the number of awesome officers I've known can probably be counted on one hand. Yeah, that's that's the same experience my older brother who served in the army had. So he, he's he, the way he put it. He's like, I didn't smoke until I got some officers, and then smoking seemed like a pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I like the other version of that word, smoke. Um, but speaking of which, uh, Pete, I I just so happen to have found your um, your map. Would you like me to share that up on the screen so that people can take a gander? Absolutely. All right. So. Um, yeah, we uh, a mutual friend of the show, big supporter of both Galaxy's Edge and Forgotten Ruin. She goes by the handle Shadow the Illustrator. Um, she actually, uh, uh, we'd seen some of her maps before, and she actually came up and was like, you know, I could probably help you cats with this and and develop this map. And it was just, it was just gorgeous. Let me just adjust oh, the size is, here. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous. I mean, he they, she did such a good job, and it's got everything. You know, everything you can see, everything. It's just just absolutely amazing you know you got tiak morfarago right here did i say that right because like i haven't listened to the audio all the way through yet my, i actually had my phone read the books the first two times i heard it so like pete and i were it's talking the other yeah. yeah a lot uh, of a lot of the names i did steal from uh, gaelic with just making a little bit of adjustment for you know linguistic drift right uh, on but yeah, the, uh, I can't necessarily always remember off the top of my head what the initial meaning was, but most of the names do have meanings. A lot of the, uh, some of them are straight ripped from uh, mythological uh, characters. I mean, you know, he's uh, he's he's hanging out over here most of the, uh, most of the time. Our boy. Uh, uh, but like I don't know, Vahava Peka was kind of a cool place. I mean, when we get to see that, so yeah, this map is is super cool. It's got that, it's got that uh, that antique um, kind of flair to it. You know, it's just really well done. Feels Conan you know, and Tolkien at the same time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Need, need I, am, I am a Robert E. Howard fan too. <laughs> what was that, Daniel? He said, "Need more coffee stains." Yep. <laughs> aka blood splatter i think th i think i think peter could set a cup of coffee down on it and sign it and those would be special editions and uh maybe we could do that for mission 22 next year oh that I'm would be dope. Dope. and it and it comes with a, a box of crayons <laughs> <laughs> i knew it was coming right. at some point <laughs> now 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 here's the question is it going to be like the crayola crayons or are we going rose art like wow. we, we gotta wow. find out if wow. we're gonna you know we're gonna <laughs> skimp on some stuff or not it just all depends on what tastes the best <laughs> oh my god you know it's funny i never heard the the crayon jokes until after i got out yeah yeah i never heard that until i met jr hanley <laughs> author of the reservist he, he loves to pick on, on marines with the crayons thing and i'm like you know it's it's all funny when you're behind the screen bro uh try try that stuff when you're lip to lip see what happens JR will be the first writer to ever be beaten to death at his first book signing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. Oh my god! With crayons, with crayons jammed into every orifice. Because <laughs> <laughs> he does, he uses that joke all the time. It's crazy. Uh, he, he's going to so be like already. Homer Simpson, where he just keeps getting the crayons up <laughs> there and just like what I had in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i like um, to just say hey at least the marine corps understood what always understood what camouflage was supposed to do yeah you ain't lying that grandmother's couch stuff that was terrible um <laughs> got another question coming in from twitter uh what is the difference about a marine taking on a fantasy realm versus other branches unit culture more than anything else I mean, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of rangers since uh, since getting out, and I mean, we get along like brothers from another mother for the most part. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 common language, it's unit culture, more than anything else. Because at the end of the day, it's all about finding what's bad and shooting it a lot until it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I like. Amen. Uh, no. Of course, with, with recon, a lot of a lot of our bread and butter was 
moving quietly, stealthily through really nasty terrain where nobody else wants to go, and setting up and spying on you until it's time to either drop something big and explosive on your head or go down and do it or do it ourselves. Right. Or call in a raid force. But uh, so there's there are a little bit of operational details that are a little different. And again, like I said, recon tends to be <clears throat> we like to be sneaky, get in, hit hard, get out without being detected whereas rangers are a little bit more look that way ranger smash <laughs> i'm only laughing because it's true <laughs> oh my god um so uh, i was a scout sniper too and i get to get I, I got to work some of that into uh book three right on yeah the uh oh no i'm not no that would spoil it um I, i'm excited because I, I i i really enjoyed the series the series is very very cool a, a very neat twist on uh on on what uh wargate books and nick and jason have done with forgotten ruin so uh it was nice to see that um uh before we're coming to the bottom of the hour so if you got questions uh get them in get them quick uh baird uh helix did you um did you have any more questions for pete Nope, no questions. Um, well, I I was kind of trying to loop in the whole like you know Marines will eat anything and the whole survival thing. Do will the Marines actually try and eat any of the creatures that they uh, slice up into little ribbons? Most of them are of a nature that any human being probably wouldn't want to try it, even a Marine, even with Tabasco sauce or a snake eater. <laughs> All right, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Right on. Uh, People will do anything if money and alcohol is involved. Mm -hmm. Which are both in short supply <laughs> in the situation they find themselves in. Let's See, there's... Just, act, yeah. you know, just Let's just smash it and keep going. Yeah, exactly. Right it's on. It's not uh, Cobra Gold. <laughs> <laughs> well, got it. <laughs> I'm not going there. Um, um, <laughs> uh, uh, how does uh, this is another question from Twitter? How does the Mar how do the Marines? This is written very strange. How do the Marines go on to pick the fantasy weapons they use when the bullets run dry? Whichever that... looks like it's going to do the most damage in a style they most appreciate. <laughs> right on. Right and again, it mostly comes down to swords or axes. And what or about what about knife. what about sort of that marine combatives jujitsu that 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 is sort of prevalent in in training? I, I just the one marine that I train with, they use that. Is that is that something we can expect to see that kind of stuff? Um, maybe a little bit as time as time goes on, and they get we see a bit more of the the hand to hands type of stuff. Um, most of what I've got in there so far is just so absolutely desperate that it's stab or cut this thing a whole bunch of times and get the hell away from it <clears throat> so that I can get enough space to reload and start blowing brains and guts all over everywhere again. See, that's the makings of a fine novel right there. <laughs> oh my God. Um, Last question from Twitter. Um, uh, they completely read the book. So um, th the only reason I know that is because they put a spoiler in here, and I'm just kind of. Yeah. Um, uh, after making certain alliances, what can we see uh, uh, in the next book that's already up for pre order? Ooh. Yeah, the, the way that the, the, the way that the person worded it on Twitter, um, yeah, he that, included that, like the ending of the book and I'm like, no, nah, I can't. Yeah, that's that's a hard that's a hard one to answer without spoiling anything. Yeah. There will be there will be more local force engagement in the books going forward, let's put it that way. Right on. And is that something that a marine uh, rec a reconnaissance marine trains for? Like, do you guys work with foreign indigenous nationals? Not a lot. Um, we had to do some. 
mainly when they had us basically working as grunts instead of doing what we were trained to do. It's like, we can do all this other stuff. Well, I want another platoon of grunts. Okay, fine. Work is work. What's that? Uh, $1.8 million to train a reconnaissance Marine from start to finish. Something like that. Yeah. And you're going to just, you know, cash the least presence be- patrols, baby. <laughs> Oh my God, that's terrible! But does that kind of experience in a Marine's uh, in a Marine's past does that help with you know him hitting the beach in this book? Well, in a way, yeah, because you're not if you've been a regular grunt, you're not necessarily going to. Well, some would be, but you're not necessarily going to be a prima donna who's like, oh no, I don't do that. It's like, well, what's got to get done has to get done. Let's do it. Uh, and if you've worked in any kind of insurgency environment, you've had to interface with the locals one way or another. Or, And what we always found was those who didn't tended to take a lot more casualties a lot faster. Right on. Yeah, because they're just wandering blindly versus tapping the local uh, indigenous, indigenous peoples for intel and resources. Yeah, and they, they didn't bother to try and even act like they were trying with the locals they just ran in started throwing their weight around and the next thing they know they're getting blown up and capped Oof. yeah that's so 10 that's pounds of brutal point. yeah no bueno um nick uh so we, we're seeing the uh, the drop of ice and monsters uh what's next up on the wargate schedule uh we are going to ring we are going to beat uh ice and monsters like a dead hooker in a cheap motel no <laughs> Nice. Um, no, like the way that we, we feel success is, is <laughs> no way. We, <laughs> we, hey, you got a little peek behind the curtain into my personal life. Don't at me. <laughs> um, I'm weird, man. Uh, no, um, the way that we, we feel success works in publishing is obviously people have enjoyed this book and gee, wouldn't it be great if you could immediately read the next one, you know, in relative publishing terms, as opposed to like, you know, how traditional publishing method is is like, Hey, do you, did you really enjoy this book? Well, hang around for another two to five years, then you might get it. And so um, that was sort of the premise of the deal going in with Peter and he more than obliged. And actually we had like a time hack because we wanted to uh, Mark Boyette who narrates the audible version, which is outstanding. He oh, had a yeah. window to, to record these books, and it was a pretty tight window. And Peter absolutely, you know, um, just what he said right there, like, no prima donna. He just stepped up and said, hey, this is the work. And and he got it done in, in, in more than enough time to just basically have three books ready to go. And I think, you know, like, he, he's seeing the merits of having this sort of series reign, and he's already working on the next one. So this is the really cool contract with the reader listener is like as much as you guys want to show up that we will continue um, to just rain books for you. Um, what happens in the larger Wargate world as a whole is I think uh, about April, we move into the next forgotten ruin book. And then we have doc Spears debuting his, his series, which is basically a special forces, 80 a team um, on 80s, a team. No, and, and at, well, kind of maybe um, an A team uh, on, on Mars uh, in sort of the John Carter esque world, and the feedback on that is that it's outstanding, and it's just like I mean, like if you're going to start a micro publishing business like Jason and I are, you really can't ask for two better powerhouses than Peter and and Doc Spears to to begin the reign, and there are I think about six to seven other authors including our very own Walt Robillard coming online with their own uh, Forgotten Ruin style series. And we are just going to make it rain in the club where we met that dead hooker before we took her back to the cheap motel and beat her to death. Uh, Ken Foster over on Facebook was like, Nick, I had to explain what you just said as my wife just walked in mid sentence. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to really, say, I'm going to really say, can't Ken, taking that context. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say, can there's really no explanation for a dead hooker. <laughs> you're just I mean, you're just gonna have to own that one yeah 
<laughs> oh, and that's where it gets weird. Uh, Pete, uh, everybody knows that, uh, you know, you can find uh, our stuff at wargatebooks.com, forgottenruin.com, and uh, galaxysedge.us. Uh, uh, however, uh, you have a whole selection of books uh, from your American Praetorian line and, and other titles that are out there and, and can be gotten while people are waiting for the lost book two, uh, Shadows and Crows. Uh, can you talk about that uh, a little bit? Like give people a target where to find you? Yeah, I've got uh, my personal website on AmericanPretorians.com. Um, also happens to have an attached shop for those who want things like signed books and patches. Um, I've got uh, the American Praetorian series of uh, military contractor type thrillers, uh, Brannigan's Black Hearts, which is a little bit more 80s mercenary action thriller type except in a more modern setting with a little bit little bit less over the top action um don't worry lots of people still get shot and blown up um <laughs> please say there is an uzi and or a mac 10 or a tech 9. there is an uzi at least there i believe there are two uzis in book four <laughs> there's a there's a different loadout just about every book so and you actually post the loadouts on your website Yes, there is plenty of gun porn. <laughs> right on. That's fantastic. And, uh, I just want to ask the audience, right. dead hookers and gun porn, what more do you want? We're trying to give you everything. <laughs> uh, Emperor Rep says uh, the body goes in the river. See, no hooker. Okay, this is how we get thrown off of all the channels. <laughs> yeah. uh, Pete, do you got a, uh, a, are you on Discord at all where you can find your other group of fans? Or um, that not I've got thing? a Discord account. I don't really use it much, but I can, I can work on that. Um, I'm on Facebook too. On uh, Pete Neal, an author. Okay. Pete, 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 uh, Pete, Peter is 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 a Marine, and he ha he is a kind, honorable uh, killer, and and he doesn't need to go to the darkness that is Discord. It's you know we we don't need to see that Pete. <laughs> I just <laughs> nice. Uh, we want to thank everybody who came out and hung out with us for a little while on uh, YouTube, on Facebook, and then on Twitter. Uh, we want to thank the the folks that came over uh, uh, from the Galaxy's Edge uh, Signal and uh, Telegram accounts uh, that uh, jumped onto the feeds that I was uh, kind of watching and, and shot us some questions. Thank you for that. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for coming out and uh, sharing some time so that we can talk about the book and give people a, a real feel for it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me out. Absolutely. And, 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 and thank you, sir, on behalf of Jason and I, I. I messaged you earlier today, but, you know, like what an honor and a privilege to get to, to publish this. It really is one of the high points of my career. And uh, I just I, 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 I tried to share my heart out uh, with it every today across all the channels. And I think it's doing so well um, that for a long time it broke the Amazon algorithm and it didn't update. So I'm kind of keen to see the end of day sales numbers. But uh, so far, uh, the, the numbers are really encouraging. And that's just that's that's just the coolest thing. But uh, it, it really is cool that, you know, like you don't care about that. You, I, you really are a, a really honest storyteller and you have an integrity about that, that, that just really comes through. And, and I just can tell the way that you're talking about what you've written and then holding back kind of what, what's coming. And that's really the ma the mark of a master storyteller myself. I will just spill all the guts and everybody will be like, great. I don't need to read that novel anymore. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just, again, from, from Jason and I, thank you for the privilege of getting to, to publish you and to all the readers and listeners out there. If you haven't picked this up, please go pick it up. It really is our, our first big commercial venture and, and we want to do it for that. And, what we really want to do is we want to we want to show people that uh, we can publish authors uh, like Peter, veterans who write extremely, extremely well. And we want those veterans who are out there who maybe don't understand the publishing business, who but have this story to tell to, you know, possibly trust us um, with their stories. Because I do think without getting political and Jason always says when I get political that when I say without getting political, it means I'm going to get political. I'm not. 
but we are we are having this culture war where stories like this aren't allowed to be told anymore and and this is the place to do it at wargate publishing so please support that if you dig that thank you hell yeah and, and, and thank so you guys for thinking of me first and bringing me on here too hells yeah oh yeah nothing better on your right or your left than a marine with a machine gun yeah so, and the marines awesome. are the first first in last out right so you know, that's a, uh, you're the first one on the beach. That's how it's supposed to be. Hell yeah. Uh, we want to once again, thank everybody for coming out and spending a little time with us to talk about the lost book one ice and monsters. Uh, we hope to see you back again uh, when book two drops and maybe we can do the same thing. I'm done. All right. That's how you do it folks. You threaten people with a good time. We'll catch you next time.